And we are recording. All right, Mr. Boobles, kick us off, man. All right, so we have a special episode today. We have the Agile Pubcast and the Agile Wire uh, combining powers. So we have Jeff and Paul joining the two Jeffs here. Um, and we're just going to um, do a joint episode for everybody out there and, and see what comes up. Um, we were talking about bef- before we got recording about just some of the things uh, we've been experiencing and want to share those. But I don't know. Jeff and Paul, you guys normally start with, you know, cracking a beer and, and right, talking about drink. that. Yeah. Uh, it's a little early for Jeff Molesky and myself right now. It's, you know, so 6 a.m. We're like, ah, we'll start. I think we'll stick with the coffee. But um, if you guys want to go ahead and grab a beer, I think uh, I think that's a, that's a good time for that. All right. I'm, well, I'm, I'm on the Bex. Haven't had a, a German beer for a while. So. Empty in the fridge, Jeff. Yeah, normally I, I've I've uh, I've been been told I've I've been too loyal to the IPA, so I'm, I'm going for a lager today. So I've got um and I've got a box of, of mystery ciders, and I've numbered them now. So I'm going to let um, our guests choose a number of the ones that are remaining. So it was originally uh, twelve, and um, so you can pick a number between one and twelve. But I'll tell you the ones that are now missing. Number two is gone. Um, number eight is gone. And number 12 has gone. So any of the numbers remaining you can choose for me to drink today. First one to shout out a number wins. Five. Five. Oh. <laughs> okay. Boobles uh, is too slow with this. <laughs> yeah. So number five, it's this one. It's a Harry's Cider hmm. uh, made in Somerset. Six percent. Nice <laughs> lunchtime. <laughs> nice for a lunchtime drink. Uh, yes, it's made. Where is it made? Does it say? It just says Somerset. There's no actual address. So yes, I shall crack this one open. It's got a nice kind of Union Jack on the on the top. On the so bottom. For our, for our American compatriots here, Somerset is pronounced Somerset. <laughs> <laughs> because I one of our Somerset based listeners for guest comment there. They, that's the only thing they would have understood. It's um it's a, traditionally a quite a, a farming county. Yeah. Um, in the sort of northeast of the southwest, I think you'd say. Yeah. So, um, if you if you know the little bit of of the UK, which where England branches off to Wales, it's around around about there, that sort of okay area. Yeah, it's uh, nice. Quite quite rough. Quite well known for their ciders in that part of the world. There we go. Uh, we're gonna. We, I think I think we should uh, we should get into some kind of norms here. And so Molesky is already called Bubbles Bubbles. So is it Bubbles or Boobles? Boobles. Boobles. Um, so I think having three Jeffs on the call is crazy. So I think we should have no Jeffs on the call. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be Watts. Wattsy. Okay. <laughs> Boobles. And uh, in the absence of any other creative nickname, we'll go for Molesky. It is Molesky. Yeah, it no, no, you you hit the nail on the head. I, I was just chuckling when you said creative uh, nicknames. Having a, a last name like Molesky, I've heard quite a few uh, clever <laughs> plays on that name. Especially, I, I was in the army for a little bit of time, and okay. uh, they they had a, they had some fun in that. It was almost as fun as being in sixth grade again, having <laughs> having a name like Molesky. But anyway, so. Yeah. It's something we do in, in our in the classes that Jeff and I run. We ask um, one of the kind of uh, icebreakers, if you like, one of the warm up activities that we do is we ask people to share nicknames, and it's as uh, this little bit of vulnerability that um, people have perhaps never told that their their colleagues or their the, the the other members of the of the class that of what their their first or their school nickname was, and some of them are quite odd. Some of them are quite obvious, but some of them need need an explanation, mm-hmm. and um, it's quite a fun activity to do. It's, yeah, sometimes you never share them. That's a pretty good one. I like um, I like doing the different types of icebreakers if I can avoid it. You know, just the the name and a little bit about yourself. That seems yeah. to be a little bit overdone. Um, but hey, that's actually that's actually a good question. How have you, you know, when? Uh, Jeff and I, we, we used to do a lot of classes. We would just create, uh, you know, like big stickies and put them up around the room and have people walk around and grab a partner and kind of introduce themselves to the partner. And then the partner would kind of introduce that person after they've answered some of these questions. Um, how, how have you two been handling that with uh, virtual classes? Uh, so, yeah, I, 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 using an online whiteboard, we do it. 
so it's, again, similar thing. They can um, almost like create um, a little bio of themselves using a virtual whiteboard. Mm -hmm. So a few things like maybe a, they can grab a picture that they're, ha they're happy to share and stick it on, on the online whiteboard. So we can, rather than just looking at their Zoom, we can reference um, mm -hmm. perhaps a, a funny photo or some, something that's interesting, that, a situation that they found themselves in. And again, a, a couple of maybe likes and dislikes um, rather than you know, it can be a bit more descriptive if just giving them a bit more time. I generally still send people away to maybe like virtual breakout rooms to do it in smaller groups, but try and gather a bit more of a bio about people and, mm -hmm. and actually create a nice little uh, online memento that, for, that you can kind of drag around the course with you and do mm -hmm. on, a, on a virtual whiteboard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, then, and Jeff, anything different for you? One of the things that's worked quite well for us in the past, and it, I think it translates really, really well to the virtual world, and actually possibly even more important in, in the virtual world, is the, is the positive thing. So tell me something that, that's good about your week, or tell me the highlight of your year, or something like that, or you know, so, something that you're grateful for today, or something like that, it just gets people off on a, a nice positive start. Because quite often we'll start with you know what questions on your mind, and usually it's based on some frustration at work or something that they you know they want to, they want to tackle, which is great. That's why they're here. Um, but equally, it starts with a problem rather than, than a yeah. kind of positive. Uh, so we've got time for that. We're going to do that. But mm -hmm. equally, let's let's get ourselves off on the on, on the right foot. How about you? Um, one of the things that I I did recently, and I like doing, it's a liberating structure called Mad Tea. But it's like, how do you do that virtually? So. With Zoom, we do breakout rooms, and I had a large collaborative session a week or two ago, and we just started everyone off, and we just broke them into groups of two randomly, and just gave them a powerful question, like uh, just like you're saying with Jeff, like you know, what's been the the greatest accomplishment you've had over the last year, or something like that, and just give them that, um, and then usually you just give them like a minute, and they have to share that time box, and then you pull them back, but we found like, hey, you can't go that short anymore because people like need time to introduce each other and that chit chat, like that just. There's no room for that in a, a virtual meeting, so you need to give them a little bit more time. So we found like, okay, two or three minutes is good, and then we did, you know, come back and forth and give them different questions and have different people meet different people, and then, you know, have some people share some highlights, and then you kind of get to know who, you know, you get to hear what happens uh, in these breakout rooms. But as a facilitator, what I found is what's very different is you don't hear all the chatter, so you're just like, I hope it's working well. I hope people are having good conversations. I really have no idea, but usually you get the feedback afterwards, like, yeah, this was this was great. So yeah, it's kind of you, you find yourself um, in, left in the main room don't, when you when you set up all these breakouts. You think, yeah. well, I'm kind of just staring at myself on a camera now, <laughs> and anyone could could come back into that room whenever they want. Um, but you kind of think. Well, what do I do now? It's just like it's like you kind of. Uh, so I find myself just like maybe, perhaps a bit unprompted, dropping into breakout rooms. It's just, but then you feel like you're you're kind of eavesdropping on people. So right. It feels a bit weird. So, but that's the one of the things that I found about breakouts. One thing I was going to ask you guys actually, I can ask you while you're here. How do you manage time? So with with if you've got like you know ten breakouts that that, that all of a sudden start. How do you make sure everyone's aware of that time? Because I know that in Zoom you can you get like a one minute countdown when you close the rooms, but do you, is there a way you can share a time, a common time that everyone can see at the same time? Um, I haven't found a t common time. There's a countdown in Zoom. There's also um, some of the tools do have a timer in them, and I set that timer, which everyone's okay. using as a canvas. Okay. And then you can send messages to each of the breakout rooms too. So I've just done that too. Like if we're giving a little longer one. Maybe yeah. like, okay, you know, you, maybe you have a 20 minute time box to do a big activity. Well, I'm going to give them, you know, a five minute check in or something like okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. That's yeah. what I've done. I, I've sent, you can broadcast to everybody. So I'd say five minutes gone, 10 minutes left or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would say, and again, I think we're talking specifically with Zoom here, but uh, for, for them, it'll, from a student perspective or a attendee perspective, it'll display the the time left of the, the breakout room in the upper right hand corner for them. Oh, so, okay. And you found you found your uh, your online delegates enjoying activities as much as your your physical classes. <laughs> so, y y yeah, no, and I, I guess maybe this is alluding to a comment I made earlier. But uh, <laughs> for 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 better or worse, the the SDO the Scrum.org curriculum is very activity heavy, and mm -hmm. I, I try and set that expectation with students early on. I, I you, you know, you're going to get out of this class what you put into it. You're going to learn just as much from me as a trainer as you're going to learn from the other students. You're going to learn through hands-on, um, tactile interactions with the exercises. So be prepared to do a lot of exercises. And 
Um, at the end of day two, uh, one of the, the students forgot that, or didn't know that his mic was hot, and he, he came back in, sat down deep side, he was just like, oh, please God, no more fucking activities. And, <laughs> and you know, I, I felt for him because, to, to be honest, uh, um, I, I've had that literal same thought coming back at the end of some of the classes. Now, don't get me wrong, I loved the classes that I was a part of, but there was just at a certain point where it's like, you're drinking from the fire hose. Um, you know, there's just so much content being thrown at you. You're trying to make it applicable. You're mentally and physically exhausted by the end of the day. And you're just, you're just like, okay, let me, let me relax and just soak up this, this learning at this point, because, um, I, I'm just kind of, it, uh, I'm failing for the words for it, but, uh, it, I, I totally got where he was coming from. And luckily I've reached out to him afterwards and we had a good conversation about it. Got some good feedback about the class on it, but, I think you raise a good point with that, which is uh, we we had spent probably a week rebuilding the class to do it online. And so there were some real quick learnings from the few, first few uh, classes that we did. Um, in particular, if, if I talked for more than, let's say, three to five minutes tops, I would lose people. So mm -hmm. it, it couldn't. In, in, you know, not that I do that all the time in a classroom, but there are teaching moments when you're in a classroom. There are teaching sessions where you're going to go in and go a little bit deeper with topics. But it was just how do we, how do we continue to engage students in a virtual environment? So it was every few minutes I needed to remember to just randomly pick a student and call on them. Right. Because now, you know, it's a little bit of trickery, but it's like, oh, shit, I better pay attention because he might call on me. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but just little things like that, when you're transitioning to do a class virtually versus doing it in person, um, you have to do that. Uh, my, sorry, I'm going on for a, a minute here, but my, my bigger concern with so uh, I'm many waiting for you to randomly pick me, I'm paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> my, my concern with with this from a, a student perspective and not from a, a, a scrum or an agile training student perspective. I'm really thinking of my niece whose school is now all going virtual. I mean, I spent almost literally a week rebuilding, retooling two days worth of training. Mm. And you've got teachers out there who have an entire semester of material that they're supposed to be teaching now online. And I, 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 my heart goes out to them um, because there's just there's no way one that that's happening in the realm of reality that's just not happening that that time box is of 24 hours in a day is not happening and then you've got all these students that are trying to do virtual learning and there's just kind of a, a snowballing effect so um, sorry a lot, a lot of information there but I just kind of feel for a lot of the teachers in academia right now who are trying to struggle to do their lectures with 250 students that they would typically have in a lecture hall or something like that. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I, I think, and I think um, we are learning as we go. And even the, so the Scrum Alliance especially is, is no different. And they're the, the initial constraints that they put on us as trainers on how, how we could train has changed because based on real feedback from people taking these classes that, and I think now, Jeff, you might we might have to edit this if I'm wrong, because sometimes I do get these things wrong. <laughs> but we can teach effectively a, a CSM class over multiple days or weeks. Mm -hmm. Jeff, am I right? I believe that to be correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, we have the same thing on the yeah. Scrum.org classes now too, so we because can I think them out. I think an, an eight hour, a nine to five class, like like you said, Jeff, that when you are, if it's too, if you're firing information. It's, it's just too much to process and people yeah. can't, it's physically and mentally exhausting. And, um, and people, you've got to bear in mind, people have probably been on Zoom calls or, or online calls for the other three days of that week anyway. So if they're, if they're still full, in full-time employment, they're constantly on an online call. So it's looking at various different ways that you can alter how to deliver the content. And it doesn't always have to be you know, firing it straight down um, someone's camera lens that would go for eight hours straight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I found that, you know, in addition to just calling out students, but that's that's where I found the activities are more helpful in that. So I go for an hour, every hour we take a 10 minute break. I encourage people, hey, go do some burpees or some push ups or something like that, because I, I do. But uh, that at least gives them that 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 you know, mental unburdening that mental, yeah. or, you know, letting off the weight there and then an hour for lunch. So it's, it, you know, it takes a little bit away from the overall time box that I have for two days, but, 
Um, I'm, I'm just a fan of keeping yourself mentally fresh, come back from it. And then, like I said, even though in person, at the end of two days, you're mentally exhausted. And it's weird. You'd think maybe it's easier sitting in front of a, a, a monitor for eight hours, but I think it's just as challenging for people. It's it's really about how engaged you are mentally. That's that, um, you know, is the exhausting part of the training. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, my daughter's uh, online schooling as well. And they were as they were getting used to it, they didn't have another they didn't have a swear word issue. Um, but but one of her classmates did actually leave her microphone on when she went to the toilet. Oh no! <laughs> and uh, it, it kind of broke the ice a little bit. It was the, they they took it all in good humor, and and, and uh, the the student took it in good humor as well. And it kind of just I don't know, it just made things a little bit easier for them. Obviously, it was mm. completely accidental, and they would rather it not have happened. Um, but yeah, all these little things that you just don't think about. Jeff, um, with with the school thing, do they monitor or do they? Which do... Jeff, which Jeff? Oh, sorry, what what's he? What's he? Um, <laughs> do they are they mindful? Do they monitor kind of chat? So in these, so can students mm-hmm. as, in a classroom, you get kind of whispering conversations mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah, that's distracting for you as a teacher, but also for you as a, a student. So. Do they shut that down? Do they do they just monitor it? Do they close it off completely? I honestly don't know. We got a, we got a message from the principal uh, with some guidelines, um, and to be honest, they, 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 there is an, a large element of of trust. Um, I, I mean, my daughter's seventeen, so I think they, they 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 do kind of treat them as adults to a large degree. Um, but the only sort of rule, really rule, that I saw standing out was no screenshots or pictures. Hmm. Um, okay. Uh, and, and that sense of you know people don't want to feel like they might be recording uh, oh. without permission. Um, but no, I didn't see anything specifically about that. But on the on the topic of chat, one thing I found really really interesting was that uh, in my daughter's school, as well as having their online lessons, uh, which they are just like you, Maleski, they're, they're doing shorter. They shorten the lessons and increase the length because they they've taken the science on board, saying it's it's more more exhausting. Um, but as well as that, they're also and I'll, I'll use the word force, okay? But they are they are requiring all students um, to to join non lessons online with groups of other students. So they're they're required to be there yeah. with other students, not to learn, but just to chat, just mm-hmm. to socialize, so that you're not either in lessons or off on your own. Are and these thought, their friends or or randoms? Well, I think to begin with, it, it, I think they're, what they're doing is they're mixing it up a little bit because yeah. they don't just want the little little groups to, to really isolate and clique yeah um, but yeah just to, just to be there and with no no teachers and um, just just to just to chat and this is the same class uh, the same school that she had a she had a lesson on small talk mm. a ago, which as well as you know being able to learn your your academia and, and things like that just being able to talk to people i think is a really good skill to learn at school you know mm. mm-hmm. My um, kids are seven and 10 and they do the same thing, but there's teachers because they have to help facilitate it, but they do random groups of kids in their class and they do like Google Hangouts and it's just the talk because, I mean, it's hard for them too not having that social interaction um, that they have every day and that's important to build, you know, that competency as well. So I, I find it really interesting. It's, it's always fun for me to kind of hear them because, you know, you see my setup here now with my mic yeah. and stuff like that. And so like, see my seven-year-old sitting here talking in the mic and people are like oh wow look at your mic that's really cool and and he has to explain why you know why he has this nice setup because he's you know looking at my sitting in my office and stuff so i was um, saying um sorry to interrupt you there but it just reminded me of uh, something else my so i've got i've got quite a wide range of ages of kids like 17 13 and one and so so my one-year-old is that's a hell of a spread (laughs) yeah yeah and, don't ask uh, any questions. Just don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so my so my one year old had only just really started going to nursery and interacting with other kids. And obviously, he has other kids at home, but he doesn't see them as kids. They're they're grown ups to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he's gone. To, he's not really interacting with any other kids. And uh, however long this goes on for, I don't know. But that's that's a really weird thing for him. He doesn't think it's weird because that's all he's known. But to not have that interaction is going to be a massive part of his development. Mm-hmm. And that's something I hadn't really considered uh, until yesterday. Yeah, it's pretty hard to do a virtual uh, Zoom session with one-year-olds, right? <laughs> like, 
yeah, it, yeah. That all the as well as just knowing that there are other ones out there, and, and but, but also the little things like learning to share toys and, and mm-hmm. that, all those little things. Yeah. So, yeah. so speaking of which, when we were talking earlier, and even just what you were talking about, Watsi, um, I've I found that helping or not helping, but having the students build a working agreement as one of the first things that they, they do in, in the classes is as powerful as it was before. I feel like it's even more so, um, you know, um, just this past week or week or two, um, two it, just out of coincidence, two, two of the students, they were both both male. Um, they both had newborns. So one was a four month old and one was a six month old. And they made numerous cameos throughout the, the two days of training. Right. Like at one point, the guy was doing like overhead presses with the baby, holding him by the legs, <laughs> so getting a good workout in. Um, but, you know, I as a trainer, like what how am I supposed to, tr- you know, control that situation and, and try and set the guardrails for them? You know, granted, I, I, I do set those expectations, be professional with one another. No, you know, we're in a very different situation than what we normally do. But then I just kind of open it up and, and allow the students to create that own working agreement together. And it, like every time thus far, and I think I've run six or seven virtual classes now in the past few weeks, um, every time it's been magic with, with them coming up, creating their own agreement, holding each other accountable. And, you know, we always revisit it throughout the day, revisit it day two, et cetera, just to make sure it's real. Uh, but every time I feel like as a trainer, that thing has probably saved me more times than, than any any rules that I would put in place. Um, mm-hmm. And and they're holding each other accountable. So um, if, if you're not using one, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. It's just been very helpful. And that's yep. probably something for me that's changed. So initially, because I did it my first virtual class probably now about three weeks, two, three weeks ago, and I was quite a lot more dictatorial about it. Because I, I, and I, almost maybe I was expecting the class to, to, for me to take the ownership of these are the rules that, and tell us what to do. And I, I've still got them on my screen, so I've written them down, some ground rules. Um, but now I think you're right. I think now as people have got more used to how online meetings work and the levels, the expectations people have are probably, are probably a bit lower than they, than they thought they were because we are all human. There's a lot of uh, all our kids and families are at home as well. There's stuff going on that we can't control and we've got to maintain a, a work-life balance. So I think people will be much more happy, to, like you said, to, to set those rules for themselves because they've got so much more experience about it now. And that, that gives me a lot more, I worry about that a lot less because I think people will self-manage it and probably respect it a little bit more than they, they would have done before. Yeah, when I see these some behaviors, you know, like when we're doing these remote sessions, one of the questions I ask often is like, how would this translate um, in the if we were in person? Yeah. So, if we're doing chat and it's going back and forth, but you know, somebody's trying to convey some information, that'd kind of be like passing notes in the back of the room, right? Like, mm-hmm. come on, we're professionals here. Like, that's not that's not professional. Or if you don't turn your video on, it might be like wearing a bag over your head going into a, an in person meeting. That would just be weird. Like, let's not be weird. Um, things like that, right? Like you could take almost any of these scenarios, um, even the baby, like I would say, well, what would that be like? It'd be like bringing your baby in. And some people might be like, Hey, that's bringing your whole self to work. I love that. Let's do more yeah. of that. You know, yeah. like, yeah. let's just accept I, that. I had, I had someone bring their baby to an in-person CSM I did a few years ago. Um, and it was awesome. So this, this lady was, she, she'd been looking <clears> forward to this class for ages and childcare let her down. And she, she asked and she asked me i, I said I've, I've got no problem with it um and the, the the students had no problem with it and she brought she brought this baby along and it joined in and it was playing with the lego and everything and and, and it worked out brilliantly mm-hmm. um, so yeah i i think had, had yeah it's just challenging our assumptions about what's possible and, and what can work i think isn't it which is a good thing mm-hmm. we've had we, we we ran a session with um back in norway if you remember this paul um, so we did a session at a conference in Oslo many years ago, and uh, my my daughter just ne- doesn't know what I don't know your kids what do they think Daddy does you know I, they see me leaving now and again with some boxes of Lego and some post-it notes and no idea what I do. Um, mm-hmm. So we had we had the opportunity. So she came along and she she helped us teach a teach a workshop over in Oslo. Uh, she loved it. The students loved it. Um, yeah, it was it's good fun. Yeah. Yeah, my kids are death. Even now, they say. <laughs> yesterday, at, over dinner, uh, we asked my kids, as we do every now and again, "What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do when you grow up?" And my son said, 
No, my daughter said, I want to work for Agilify, which is my company. <laughs> and I went, really? Why? I said, oh, you just, you just, you just looks great. <laughs> she, doesn't, she doesn't have a clue what I do, but she just wants to work, work for me. I don't know why. I tend she that she wanted to. She said she wanted to work for Agilify. I think she's going to have a. There's going to be a hostile takeover of your. Company. Yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> she's, going to buy, she's going to buy me out. Maybe. Um, my kids, they, they really like, like like yours. They don't. They have no idea what I do. They they hear about it. And they're like, "What?" And I tried to explain it to them, and they're just, "I'm not quite getting it." And so they make fun of me now. I give them a hard time about stuff all the time. So they make fun of me. And so they're like, yep, my dad scrums the toilet or teaches people how to scrum the toilet. So, <laughs> so One thing I will do before this whole lockdown thing ends is I will, if I'm doing a class or a, an online session, if we take a break where all the cameras go off or people walk off, I will come and I'll switch my camera back on with my son in the seat. <laughs> And just see if see how people react. Just let him let him teach the next part or the main character's going to teach it. And he'll be start standing in front of the screen, smiling away. Yeah, they love it. They love the whole um, the the tech because I've um, they, my kids now because they're, they're homeschooled. They've had access to uh, lap, more lap the laptops, the, the iPad, and things the tools mm-hmm. that they never really probably had the chance to use at school. Because I've got I've got a few of these things that they can so the things of uh, like filling in a worksheet but doing it electronically with a pencil on an iPad they've never thought this, Daddy this is amazing I've I've never experienced anything like even uh, flip charts and whiteboard pens they don't get the chance to use a real a, a whiteboard pen so they've just been um, they've been raiding my stationery cupboard <laughs> so I'm using it despite the fact I'm not teaching in uh, in person classes. My stationary levels are still dropping because my kids are just post-its. They're just taking post-its out of my cupboard all the time. But they love it. And they've got post-its everywhere all over their, 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 the dining room. So, yeah, it's good. I found, um, I found another interesting side effect of this. Um, and, oh, is, is Molesky gone? Is he just showing us something? Mm-hmm. This video might have shut off, I think. Oh, sorry. I was just grabbing a tissue real fast since we're recording this. <laughs> we don't want to see you blow your nose. Yeah. <laughs> just, well, like, like you, are you just trying to send us a really subtle message there? <laughs> <laughs> but sorry. For those, that, those that aren't watching, there's there's a map that came up on the screen there. In, in space. But um, no, I was saying that um, the, the sort of um, icebreaker type thing, we did a, we did, I, I can't really take the credit for but there, I, I was speaking at a meetup group, due to speak up at a meetup group yesterday. And obviously, I, I couldn't um, because you can't travel. But um, then I got asked to do a step in at another meetup group on the same day somewhere else. Uh, I said, would you do it virtually? And so I said, well, why don't we just do them both virtually? Yeah. There's no mm-hmm. reason why not. Um, and then it sort of grew. So yesterday was a, a collection of four meetup groups from completely different parts of the country. Uh, so we had about I think just over 200 people um, joining through through Zoom, and so we had all these different organisers who got lots of different experiences of, of running different things, both in person and virtually. Uh, and they, they, one of the one of the benefits that people have said in the past of these meetup groups, as well as learning, is is just meeting other people, networking, and and now you have the opportunity to meet people from different parts of the country, and in this case, different countries. So at the start, they did this virtual networking where they just dropped people randomly into um, small breakout rooms of two or three mm-hmm. people. And it was just, who are you? You know, what, what, what's, what's the best thing that being part of a really great team, that kind of thing. And where I'm going with this is that they didn't have a choice as to who they spoke to. Mm. But in, in, a, in a physical room, you would. Yeah. Um, sure. And you naturally gravitate to people that you feel safe to talk to for whatever reason. Whereas here they didn't. And um, again, the feedback was overwhelmingly almost, uh, I think it was, I, I didn't see anything negative about it, apart from they wished they had more time for it. Mm. Um, so yeah, in, in person, you might do speed speed dating sort of two minutes here, there and everywhere, but they wanted they wanted four. Um, and everything takes a bit longer, like you said. Yep. Um, but that, that you, you're getting past your cognitive biases and your that, that sort of natural associations through the use of technology. Mm. It's that Tim Harford um, experiment, wasn't it, Jeff? I can't remember which book. It, is it in his book called Messy? Is it Messy? Messy. When he talks about uh, they, they studied um, conferences, networking conferences, where they are, they a social experiment where they asked people to attend with the deliberate um, intent that they were asked to network 
with people at a networking conference but they found that the people just gravitated towards the people that they knew, even when they were told explicitly to network with people they didn't. And we've all seen that at conferences that we, we tend to gravitate towards people we know because you, well, that's completely natural because you want to talk about things that you share. Um, but with the benefit with Zoom, and it is a bit scary, but you can randomly just throw people out into rooms with people that they've never met before. I mean, there, there is a, a risk, a, a coincidental risk that they might know someone in the same room. But I think that's um, it's kind of kind of refreshing. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I do too. I think. Do, it's you, guys, do you guys know? I, I, this is a completely unfair question. I can't imagine that you would, but you do. Um, do you know the actual reason behind the virtual background feature in Zoom? It's not guess, just other, 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 my other, guess. Right. My guess is people are self conscious of like what's in their house and they don't want to share their background, and so I they just, want a way to hide that. That's that's the case. That's what's coming out, right? It's a good leveler. It's a good safety feature. Um, I just wonder whether that was in the intent or whether it was sort of a, a happy accident or a feature that's got morphed because of how it was actually used. You know, you see a lot of those features, don't you? It was designed for one thing, but people have used it for another reason, mm -hmm. um, and. I, I think that's one of the most, I would suggest possibly one of the most surprisingly used features of Zoom now and other tools because they, they, they've all pretty much got the same thing. Yeah, you think I, people, more people are using it now, do you think? You, more, you see more virtual backgrounds than you have before? I think if you'd have asked people to put a value on it, it would have been really low, but now yeah. I think the value on that feature would be a lot higher based on mm -hmm. how well Yep. Yeah, I've had uh, a number of students have a lot of fun with with putting the backgrounds on, and I and I feel like that's that's awesome. Like, have have some fun with it. Like, some guy took a picture of the office, and I can't remember the the manager from the office just sitting over the cubicle wall. So about those TPS <laughs> reports, you know. So he had that in, in back of him. Another one had um, uh, what's that Netflix show? The 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 Lion, not the Lion King. Yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah. Tiger King. Tiger King. Tiger King. Tiger Thank King. you. King. Had a, had a background of the Tiger King uh, behind him. And, it, you know, hey, it just made me chuckle every time I was I was looking at him. So um, I, I, I agree, Watsi. Um, you know, I, I don't think it was intended to have that much value, but I think a lot of people have gotten a lot of value out of it. So kind of kind of a cool little example there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I imagine it was one of those fun features yeah. that, the, yeah. that the devs put in for their own amusement. Mm. Yeah. And, and yeah. actually, it's, it's turned out to have a massively beneficial side effect. Yeah, the reason I think it's so important is because like a lot of people signed up to work, you know, in person at a certain location, and now they can't, and and they feel they don't want to turn their camera on because it's like I don't want to show everybody, I don't feel comfortable showing everybody my home, and the virtual background gives them no excuse, right? Like, oh yeah, we can still have an in-person conversation. You just hide your background if you don't want people to see if you're in your kitchen and you don't want people to see your kitchen or whatever the the case might be. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a I think it's a really nice. Uh, feature as well. I've also found like playing with it has been really helpful for your people. So at some of the clients I've been at, we just done some virtual happy hours and we just play with the tools and be like, you know, like everyone try a virtual background and like, or people just do it organically. And all of a sudden I was like, how do you actually do that? And like people just start <laughs> playing with it and the settings and then they start figuring out there's other things they can do. Um, and it's really helped them in, you know, future meetings because they understand the tool much better. I just thought actually that, Combining that with something that I mentioned earlier on about that sort of positive start to things, I think maybe maybe in an icebreaker pool, we, we, we could set a virtual background that, that is a photo of, of a happy place. You know, yeah. some, and and mm. when you're looking at the screen now, you've got that constant reminder of you on that holiday or yeah. on yeah. The China or whatever it is, you and your family, whatever. And it's just that constant happy, happy, happy. Yeah, yeah. Happy or safe, yeah. Mm. And the, the thing, so I was yeah. just going to mention something else, Jeff. I know that you did, I think you did on this um, webinar that you did this week, was, and it links back to what Molesky said about um, checking in with people. Mm. Didn't you have something in there about you used one of the features around polling that you could just get a temperature check on where people are right now as a way yeah, to click your kind of your levels? Yeah, really quick feedback. How are we doing on energy levels? And because it's anonymous, people don't, then they feel a lot safer to see. I need a break right now. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I, I generally, if it was a class thing, I'd say, you know, if we were in person, don't wait for the break. Need a toilet, yeah. need a coffee, go. You know, mm. uh, my, my skin has been thickened over the years with people walking out in disgust at my, at my <laughs> <laughs> just walking out to the toilet isn't going to hurt my feelings. Um, 
but yeah it was it was it was a practical reason and because i didn't know how long people wanted to go between breaks it was learning mm. but also just that sense of um asking mm. i think makes people feel that actually they are they are in this is their thing it's not my thing it's their thing mm -hmm. I've also used um, in Zoom, they've got this uh, participants thing that you can turn on in the settings. That's It's not on by default, but if you turn it on, you get a, um, little extra options as a participant, like go faster, go slower, yes, no, uh, coffee break. What, you know, there's a bunch of different things that people can put in there. And mm -hmm. as a host, you can you know put that up on another screen or that's what I do. And then I ask people to like, give me feedback when I'm asked a question, like I'm gonna ask rhetorical questions that are yes, no. Hopefully you can throw it in there real quick, or yeah. if you need a break, throw it in there quick. And if I see things popping up, you know, especially for the large group, you know, you don't have to like call it out. I can, I can then help, you know, help that with my facilitation. I can use that information for my facilitation. So it's, it's do you think there, Do you think there is an optimum kind of number that you think works well for these? Um, I'm talking about trying to make maybe more classes now, as opposed to seminars or, or webinars. What kind of numbers do you think you're, you're aiming for with <coughs> these online teaching? Um, I don't know. I'm going to charge a large one in a couple of weeks here. We're going to try 30. Wow. And that's that's going to be big, but it's two, two of us that are teaching it. So I, I think, think that's, that's, yeah, that's an important thing because you kind of, when me, Jeff and I are, are pairing on a course next month. So I think the tag team element is probably even more important when you've got one person, because it's quite, I imagine it's quite hard to see that, that feedback yeah. if it's not in a kind of a, a poll results kind of chart. If it's people clicking yes, no, faster, slower, it'd be quite hard to aggregate that data. But if yeah. you've got someone that's just looking at it and saying, okay, a lot of people are saying they need a break, but perhaps we should call this short. Yeah, I found with large sessions, having two people is essential because one person's setting something up in the tool, the other person's talking and like getting the context and reading the room. And while another person like sends them off or does something else, like there's a lot of this, like you're both doing something and it, it do all that uh, yourself would be really tough, especially with a large room. Mm. Um, I think with Zoom though, like I believe if you are using that, it's 25 people you can see on one screen from that gallery view. So okay. if you have to go to two screens as one person, I think that'd be tough. So maybe that's an upper limit too to think about. Yeah, true. Yes, yeah, so, so in pa pairing is something when Jeff and I first started teaching, it was kind of, it wasn't assumed, but it was always encouraged, Jeff, wasn't it? it probably because we were quite nervous about doing it on our own, but we tended to pair on pretty much everything. And it's kind of something that which is, I think, stuck with us. Um, if we've got the opportunity to pair, we're quite happy to do it. And we, mm -hmm. we generally feel, I feel like I'm benefiting because when I'm not um, speaking, I'm listening. So it's a way to reaffirm what I'm going to say next or what, what I'm thinking at the moment. So, but I think this is perhaps an opportunity, especially given the fact that we've got more time, we've got perhaps the opportunities now to, to uh, cross pollinate and pair. I think this is, um, yeah, I think pairing is, is, a, is an, almost a, an essential part of, of um, reskilling or, or, or practicing our, our art as trainers. I think it's generally a really good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Well, was, have you guys got different backgrounds or similar backgrounds? Um, Pretty similar. Oh. Pretty similar, yeah. We were both developers at one point. Jeff took more of a product owner role. Um, I took more of a scrum master role, and then we both kind of became, you know, got into agile coaching, became PSTs later in our career. So, mm. um, but yeah, I, we pair a lot. Even even though we have similar backgrounds, we have different experiences with a lot of different teams, right? And we can bring those at different times. Yeah. And sometimes we're hearing different things, and so we pair a lot. We pair with other people a lot. Uh, I don't know. We've grew, we just grew up with that, like similar to both of you. Yeah. Um, when we were getting going, when we were, you know, even earlier on in our career, when like Jeff was a product owner and I was a scrum master and we were working on the same teams, like we'd go into clients and we would pair in front of, you know, executive stakeholders. And it just became a natural thing that we did all the time. Uh, so I think, I don't know, I'm really used to it. I love pairing. I grow so much from pairing. Like me personally, it's almost selfish. Like when I teach a class and I pair with another another instructor, like I'm learning just as much as the students are. And I always learn with the, from the students, but I learn even, you know, I feel like I learn double because I'm learning from the other instructor and from the students. So mm -hmm. I love it personally. I asked because when Paul mentioned about when we were getting started, that, that one of the reasons, yeah, it was because we were, we were quite new and, and, and nervous and we weren't actually professional trainers and all that kind of stuff. But equally... We, we did have quite a, a variety of skills. So uh, we'd have someone who, who, who came up much more 
from the XP path who could who could talk a lot more about technical practices than I ever could. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I, I paired with with Roman when and he uh, he can give very much a product feel, and and I can play a different hat. And I think that having those two different perspectives, Paul and I are, are, are more than happy to you know, effectively contradict each other in a class, and not around a fact but around an experience yeah. or a perspective or an opinion or a preference. Yeah. And I think yeah. we, we used to worry about presenting a united front, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we've gotten older. I think people get more from the fact that there are multiple ways of seeing something. Um, yeah. And you know, if you can disagree with someone that you're you know, good friends with, then that, I think that sends a few different messages out into the room, which are positive. Yep. <coughs> I've had some of the best um, training experiences but I've also had some of the worst feedback from a, from a paired mm. training session. You might not remember this, Jeff, but this was a long time ago. It was a, a, a client where they um, and they asked someone to pair with me that I wasn't perhaps familiar with and I hadn't met before the day, and, and the, it was just it just didn't work. And it it was there was like you said, Jeff um, Watsy, there was there was contradiction, there was difference of opinion, but it was destructive, and it was. You're, I think you're wrong. And I think, in fact, it was confusing because you're saying we should do it this way, but then Paul's saying we should do it that way. And it, it was confusing, it was muddled. So I think there's a there's a sweet spot here where it can be quite, you've got color commentary, as our, our friend Nigel would say, is in terms of you've got one uh, commentator that can back up and, and add some more detail without never really going off to, on, on a different tangent. But it can, if it's too opposed, it can be quite confusing for, for students to they don't really hear what the right or what the the constant message is Taking yeah a yes and approach rather than a yes but approach right exactly yeah. yep yep because i've had that too where i paired with people where it's that no but and man that's a painful thing because you're just trying to like okay how do we like bring this back together you know so they're getting uh a good message here and it doesn't look like we're fighting up in front of the room right like or in the back of the room um yeah, that's that can be a challenge. I think you're right though. It's a mindset you have to like be level set on like this is where we're going, and there might be some nuances where we disagree. And I think understanding like we agree, all agree this is the baseline, and then like here's the ways that you could approach it, and here's why you would pick one or the other. And he has his opinion on his preference, and I have my opinion, and, and that's okay. I think when you get to that point, that's great. But like if it's a core fundamental thing, and you're and um and you're disagreeing on that, people are going to be confused. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, I think that also kind of highlights, um, you know, just how few binary things there are in, in complex work, right? In knowledge work, right? You know, we are, I think a fairly standard question is, hey, we don't, we don't have a scrum master. Are, are we still doing scrum? Well, n no, if, if you're taking away something from the framework, you, you're, you're not doing it. You're doing something else and that's fine. Um, but, you know, oh, okay, we're, our, our daily scrum, you know, we talk about this and that, are we doing it wrong? I don't know, maybe. Um, maybe in, in Paul's experience, yes, and Booble's experience, no, but there's very few binary things um, to say, no, this isn't the way, or yes, this is the way you have to do it. Um, there's just, again, we've been, we've been talking about Zoom, you know, quite a bit for the past, you know, what is it now, 40, 40 minutes, but there's going to be people out there that are using Teams or, uh, I don't know, Discord or any of the other probably 50 different communication tools that are out there. And if it works for you, awesome. Like that, that's how you're sol choosing to solve the problem. Um, and your experiences are going to be shaped around those, ex or, you know, the, the, your experiences are going to be shaped in that way. So. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you found anything that hasn't really translated well yet to the, to this new world, or is it something that just, you just haven't got around to yet? Is there still a sticky problem that you know you haven't addressed yet? Hmm. I, th I think starting, so I'm, um, I'm kind of, I'm at a client right now and I'm starting in a new area and building rapport individually with people. I would normally just have a lot of these little one-off -on conversations. We have these little coaching moments, walking from one meeting room to the next, sitting down and like, Hey, just show me what's, what you're working on and look like someone like you're struggling on something. Those are just harder to get to. You don't hear about them as much. You don't get the side conversation, the, you know, the, there's just that, um, uh, serendipitous event of like overhearing things oh. um, and so I'm that's one of the things that I think I just have to put a lot I'm put, trying to put more effort into and be conscious about um, 
and just be cautious that, hey, I might not have all the rapport built up in this new area as fast as I normally would because we're not having these conversations that would just come naturally, you know, in the past. Yeah. One, one of the I'm things just... that I, I've run into, um, w you know, we've been talking quite a bit about tooling and tools are certainly going to help us solve some of the problems that we have now with, with in a virtual world. But um, the, one of my favorite movie quotes is uh, your so your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to consider whether or not they should. Uh, it's from Jurassic Park, if you're not familiar with it. But I feel like I'd have Jeff, got you, sorry, sorry uh, Melissa, uh, what's have you seen that one? I would have got that Jeff Goldblum, right? Yes, exactly. This, <laughs> the, um, the cool. Jeff's I'm, terrible I'm on films. Jeff knows no films. Okay, well, I'm glad. I'm glad I could throw one out there that she's familiar <laughs> with. <laughs> but but Very I think about on. that from from a tooling perspective. Um, just because you can use a tool, just because you find it exciting to use as a trainer or a facilitator, doesn't mean your students care about it. You know, um, I. I've had students in these virtual sessions, one was just using an iPad, so he didn't even have a computer. And that was a different scenario mm -hmm. that I had to take into account. And I know people get excited about Miro or Mural, these other tools. Oh, my alarm just went off to let me know to wake up. Um, <laughs> I know people get excited with these tools uh, to, to use them, but it's just encouraging people to also think about from a, a student's perspective or your customer's perspective, what is that like for them? So just because you can use these really neat, shiny new tools that are out there um, doesn't mean you, you, you should. Um, and maybe just sit down and consider from, from that perspective whether or not, you know, are, are you really giving your, your customers a good experience with using these tools, even though you find them really cool? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we I, are I not to, yeah. One of the things I have, have heard is that, um, and again, I'm learning from experience that one of the first classes I did, and I, I think part was a bit confusing, is that students in classes tend to like the simplicity of staying with one tool or whatever that tool might mm -hmm. be rather than drifting between multiple yeah. different ones. And I was probably guilty of trying to um, force people to say, well, now we're going to use <coughs> Google Jamboard and now we're going to switch back to using Zoom. Come back to the Zoom call now because we're using that and now we're going to use the whiteboard on Zoom and all these different, because that's just what I knew at the time and it's just what I had access to and I knew that I'd used it before, but trying to keep it as simple as possible and to keep the focus mm -hmm. on one thing rather than trying to use a hundred different tools is probably uh, an easy tip to pick up. Well, it's mm -hmm. another, another aspect of fear. And we don't learn when we're scared. We can't mm -hmm. learn when we're scared. No. And there's an element of fear of, well, what people are going to be looking in my house. Okay, I can put a virtual background on that. That calms down again. All, all these different aspects. If I'm worried about not being able to use a tool properly or look foolish with a new tool, or that, then that's another aspect that's going to limit my ability to learn. So I was interested yesterday. So my natural instinct, mainly because I'm technically limited as well, in that it takes me quite a long time to, to pick things up. Paul is constantly having to hold my hand through these new tool experiences or Andre teaching me how to use Miro and things. And I'll get there, but it takes me a while. Um, and so I was, we were doing this meetup group across four meetup groups and they obviously had their own preferences and, oh, oh we should do this and we could use this. And, and it was all great stuff. And I was a little bit worried that it was going to be a bit overwhelming. Um, so in the end, we, we had... Zoom as the, as the basis, which had its own polling feature built into it, which was great. Um, they wanted to use breakout rooms, which again was part of Zoom, so they didn't have to go out. That was great. Uh, they used Menti to gather some, some information while in one of the breakout rooms, and they used Slido to gather questions and upvote questions. And even that mm -hmm. I thought was probably too much. Mm -hmm. but they, they managed it. And yeah, they, 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 all the, the comments afterwards were this was like really well integrated. And how many times did you rehearse? Which we didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, for my benefit, Jeff, what's mentee? So mentee meter, I think, is the is the full uh, term. But basically, it's it's just basically it's a it's a, it's a website, uh, and you enter a, into a code, and you get your own particular version of it. And once you're there, you can then add data, whether it be a comment, a question, or, or what have you. Mm. And it just shows up and scrolls up on the screen, or okay. it can create a word cloud, or well, it's it's again relatively simple, as oh. most good tools are. Um, but quite powerful at, at, at collaborating. I mean, we were, we were using it at the client that I was I was at before lockdown anyway, even when we were all in the same room. It was a good way of getting, you know, that sort of one word feedback at the end of a planning session or a retrospective or something. It was a good way of getting crowdsourced feedback anonymously. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
and presented in a pretty way. So I guess what I'm saying there, I absolutely agree, mainly from my own default of I struggle with technology mm -hmm. uh, more than uh, more than I should. But equally, people are pretty adaptive um, and can can cope with quite a lot if it's if it's made simple for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. One thing that I'm doing is um, like even with Zoom, like you think everyone knows Zoom, but it's like they don't maybe don't know these extra features that are there. And so I, I spend five to 10 minutes on a lot of meetings, like especially when it's a larger group or it's people that I'm not you know normally working with explaining Zoom. If we're using Miro, we explain how to use Miro. Like just you have to take time every every time you use a new tool to explain it to your point, Jeff, because people get worried about that cool. and then they can't participate or they just you know, they disengage or whatever the thing is that they're going to do. Um, so I think that's an important thing to just take some time, explain the tool. Maybe you teach somebody something new and then they use it, you know, in the next meeting that they're in. So I think that's important. And one yeah. of the benefits of, again, doing these, we're looping back now to where we started, but the, these icebreakers, if you do the icebreaker, whatever it might be mm -hmm. in within the tool, it almost gives that creates that little bit of safety that I can chat with one person who might have, done that before within that tool so they can talk me through how to how to add my how to add an import an image to the to the whiteboard or how to create a, a sticky note wherever it might be so anything like yeah. that, that you can do but we've started to we're jeff and i experiment with with the course we're running next month but we're probably going to give people a bit of work up front to do so as a way mm -hmm. to introduce them to that tool we'll expose the tool to them a bit earlier before the class starts and ask mm -hmm. them to upload something or ask, ask them to create something in their own time so they don't feel like they're under, under pressure within a class setting to, to do it on, on, on timer so they can perhaps do it at a bit slower pace. So things like that, I think, will probably ease people in. But, yeah, it's an assumption we make that everyone's using the same tools, but, in fact, a lot of people aren't. Yeah. Have you One thing I'm thinking about, um, so running a class here in a couple of weeks and we were talking about different a checklist to go through and like do we do it with people to make sure they're actually doing it like let's test their speed let's test their mic let's test video make sure that all works let's make sure they understand how to add a sticky note like you were saying or cool. you know to these tools these let's give them the, the basic rundown in small groups so they can feel you know confident going into this course and is that something that we should do so i don't know if, if jeff have you tried that yet with the i know you've done six or seven jeff molesky have you tried something like that yet? Yeah. So one of the things that I'm, well, Rob and I with, with responsive advisors, quick plug there. Um, but in, and I think this is likely true. Well, I know it's true across the SDO scrum.org and I assume scrum Alliance as well, but like we have been, I mentioned earlier, rebuilt the entire thing intended for virtual training. We're not sacrificing the quality and the experience for the students. All right. That, that, that threshold should still be at the same level. So, I'm very particular and I do, we, we demand um, as part of the class um, that you come and do, uh, it, it takes five minutes, but you have to do a pre-check with us. And so the pre-check is going through all the tooling. It's making sure that you're comfortable with Zoom, that you know how to use it, what to expect when we use a breakout room. I'm checking their, their speeds uh, because let, let's be honest, we've all been on those meetings from hell where there's lots of background noise, uh, there's bad latency coming through, people are talking over with one another. I'm not going to subject a student to eight hours of that uh, or, or 16, right, for, for a two-day class. So it, it may sound harsh, but there's a bare minimum um, and I'm, I'm doing it because there's a quality level to this stuff. So I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to understand the tooling. And I, I try to keep it as lightweight as possible, but it's also to make sure that it's it's not going to detract from the quality of the class for the other students. Um, so I, I, and we, by extension, um, are very particular about that. And in fact, we won't send them the meeting invite for the actual class until they come to the pre-check. Mm. So it, it, if they don't come, well, they, they can't come to training. Um, yeah. so, so this, this opens up an interesting philosophical can of worms, guys. Uh, because one thing that you, you, you sort of brought to my attention, Matthew, is the idea that maybe not everybody has a computer. Yep. Um, and by extension, not everybody has high speed internet. Mm -hmm. um, and as a, as, are we, are we at the risk of creating an elite level of access to training rather than, you know, making it uh, open, open to all, not only financially, but equally within your own home. Are, you, is there, are there levels that you have to get to before you can get training, which is, I'm not, I'm not saying that's that's your intention in any way, to, but mm -hmm. there's an interesting parallel 
uh, I just find this I just find this absolutely fascinating and, and it just made my it lightened my not just my day but my week uh, when I heard about this um, and I don't know whether this is particularly uh, going to translate particularly well to you guys but I, I'll, I'll go with it anyway so <clears throat> I'm a big sports person I love sport and obviously there's not a lot of sport going on right now <laughs> but one sport is carrying on and that's darts <coughs> and what they're doing is these darts players they've got their darts boards in their own houses and they're effectively playing over video conference uh, playing proper tournaments proper matches against one another so one one guy's got his darts board in the in the kitchen another one's got it in their in their bedroom and so on and they've just got their camera set up and they've got a referee on the video call as well um, and yeah a couple of people so one of the darts players said, uh, "You know, my my darts board's on my, my on my landing. I don't know whether that translates well, but yeah, up, upstairs, downstairs. And so if, if the dart comes out of the board, I have to go down fifteen steps to get my dart. I just love the fact that these professionals have been brought down to our level. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a couple of really so we had a really big uh, landmark this year in the UK, where a female darts player beat." a male darts player for the first time in a professional tournament live on TV. And so she became an absolute superstar. Uh, and that was one of the, the sort of barriers to entry had been broken down and it was amazing. Now she's, she's been invited onto the, the regular tour with, 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 with all the male players, but she can't participate in this tournament because her internet speed isn't good enough. Mm. Um, and she said, you know, I'm trying to get my, my internet fixed so that I can play the world number one can't play because he's got dogs and a baby and it's it's too noisy with the dogs barking. And I just think that's hilarious. <laughs> the world number one can't play because his dogs are too noisy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but and, uh, do you know what I mean? That there's yeah. Uh, we, we've got. To, I don't know. I don't know how we solve that. Yeah, it's so. Uh, you're right. It is. It is a little bit of a moral quandary, and I think maybe not such a big deal for scrum training. Um, but what I would extend this out to is uh, my both my my sister and my brother in law are teachers in School. Milwaukee public yeah. schools. And MPS has, uh, unfortunately, a, a large amount of students that are on whatever the equivalent is of, of the food program, because um, mm -hmm. they don't they don't get enough food. And so they get free food when they come to school. And I'm going to butcher these numbers. Uh, so let's just say Let's make up easy round numbers, but something like 50,000 students are on this program. And so when MPS went virtual or when the, the whole pandemic started, these kids can't even afford food. They don't have home Internet um, and there was no option to teach them. Um, so now, granted, that's not all MPS students, obviously, but there was such a large number of these students that didn't have home Internet that th they, they just there is no teaching going on right now because, OK, even if they had Internet, do they have a laptop? Do they have a phone? Like, how are how are they getting access to this information? So it is a hundred percent legitimate question, and I feel like it is a, a question that we as a, as a society should maybe start to, to think about. Um, you know, when we're talking about inequality and like these kids and they are kids, they didn't make poor life choices that put them into these into these mm -hmm. situations. That's just the hand that life dealt them. Um, how you know what what is what are the choices that we as society make and say this this is OK or it's not OK. And what are we going to do for that? So this is a, a much deeper topic with it. But I think it's a it's a legitimate question for the con for the constraints of scrum training. For the time being, I'm okay saying that this is how it needs to be, um, but who knows? In, in the future, that may change. And but that's that's part of the reason Jeff and I do our podcasts. Like we we love giving back. You know, we 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 don't. There, there's no commercials that we we put on there. Um, maybe one day, but you know that's that's very far down the road. Jeff runs the meetup in, in Madison with with Chad Byer, another awesome PST in the community. Um, we do these things. One, it, it raises us up, so there's some benefit for us, you know, seen as uh, thought leaders and whatnot. But we like giving away the information that we that we have. So um, I, I do think there's some altruism that that's going on inside of there. But uh, at least for the the training online, I, I feel like it's. It's a not the compromise isn't the right word, but I'm I'm comfortable with with how we're approaching it for right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, something that I, I I just had to admit I hadn't really. It's it's very difficult to well 
I suppose it's easier for me to say it's easier to to see through your your own privileged lens, and I you know I see that a lot of people that I have I, I work with do have this, and it's you just don't notice what you don't notice, yeah, until, until it's put in front of you, I suppose. Um, and yeah, so other, some it's, it's come to my attention. I think, oh, I don't actually know how I would resolve that. You know? Yeah, it, it I mean the. So the one student that did come through with, without a laptop, I mean, it was fine. We, he just used his iPad um, and he had Zoom was running on his phone and then he used his iPad for, for the activities and, and it worked out well. But I, I, I've i never even thought about how I would handle the situation if somebody just had a phone. It'd be like they're listening on a conference call and like, I don't know, maybe maybe you could argue something is better than nothing, um, but I, I don't even know what type of experience that would be for them as a student as well. Mm. I know we've been trying to be creative with uh, the one client I'm working with, and you know, some people, they're remote, and they might be in the north woods up here in Wisconsin, <laughs> and uh, there's not really great internet. They're just not a choice, like where they live, and they can't, they can't get it, and they have multiple people trying to access the internet to both work from home, you know, husband, wife, and they just can't do the video. Um, they can do audio if they and they can both work or only one of them can work. So like after we've talked through, it's like, okay, well, this is the only thing that works. Um, what other options are there? And so we said, well, we could use, you know, your cell phone and use the LTE network up there and that could work and you could kind of dial in the two, but I get it. Like that's not your work cell phone. You only have so much data, like you can't do that all the time. Um, should we, can we be choosy? Are there certain, you know, meetings where it's like, yeah, this is really important we should probably have video for it. And there's other ones where like, it's okay not to have video. And so we've had these conversations, you know, to your point, Jeff, of like, there's real constraints, but like, what workarounds do we have? Are there anything we can do? Um, how can we get, uh, you know, at, you know, level set, the level of communication that everyone's going to be on um, when it's the most important. And so I think you got to be creative. I think we're all learning in this and uh, be open. Mm -hmm. Be out of the possible. Yep. Cool. Well, we've been recording for a while. Uh, we've, we've kind of hit our time box. Uh, yeah, is we there need any... to break every hour, right? That's what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there anything anybody wants to plug, like, before we go? Any, you know, I know you guys said you have some courses coming up, or any, you know, talks or, you know, virtual conferences, anything like that that you're doing? Uh, you wanna... I can plug my new book. Oh, your book, yeah. Team Mastery. Um, is yeah. that out yet? <laughs> oh, Jeff, Jeff's got it. Okay. I mean, I've got the other two. I just wasn't sure if that one was out yet. By the time this uh, podcast is out, it will be on. It will be on Jeff's now. <clears throat> yeah. Um, it's it's difficult to get it around the world these days, but uh, not impossible. Hey, are because I, I I get them on Audible. Um, yeah. Do, do you? I I think you narrate them. Do, have you in the past? Okay, are, are you narrating this one as well for, for yeah, Audible? It's, it's all done. It's in um, it's in review at the moment. So okay. It's going through all the automated technical review. It's just in the queue to be listened to and approved by a human. Some poor little <laughs> human somewhere is going to have to listen to my book and, and check that it uh, it meets whatever criteria they've got before they put it out for sale. But yeah. All right, awesome. Because pages are so 1990. I, I like being read to. <laughs> <laughs> and you know the the soothing sounds of Jeff Watt's voice is just it's it's pretty good. So, oh dear, cool. No, is that what about you guys? Anything? Uh, so this is it's a great. We we um, it's it's really nice to be able to get people in the UK to be more aware of other podcasts out there. It's something that we get contacted regularly about, and it's great mm -hmm. to introduce them to to you guys if they hadn't already um, come across you. Is there is there anything in particular you want them to know about? Um, there is a conference that um, I, we were going to do. It's in Iowa, actually. It's called ICR Agile, and it went all virtual. Um, it's a really good lineup of speakers, and it's really open to everybody now that it's virtual. So it's not there's no no constraints to, to joining that one. So that's April 30th. It's an all day conference. We're going to be doing breakout sessions and different things like that to, to try to get the whole social aspect of a uh, a real conference. So it'll be an experiment. I, I think that's going to be pretty great if if this gets out before then. Um, What's it also, I S D I C R Agile. So if you just, we'll, we can we can put a uh, link yeah. in the show notes, um, or you can just Google that I C R Agile. People who don't read and just want to be told. Yes, exactly. <laughs> For all those people. I C R Agile. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. 
Yep, that's coming up. And then um, I would just say, you know, we all of us have courses, so you can always check those out on, on our pages and stuff. But um, that's those are the big things for me. How about you, Jeff? No, nothing on my side, man. Just just love and life. So, <laughs> <laughs> Paul, anything you want to plug? Uh, well, we can just mention our our um, the Agile podcast we're doing during these lockdown times. Jeff and I are opening up the, the the doors of our virtual pub on a Friday in the UK it's kind of uh, 5 p.m. Fridays so we're, we're well open to any international uh, customers who'd like to come and join us for a virtual drink it's um, just literally freeform chat meet some people you might not have met before networking and sharing some stories and sharing a beer with, with me and Jeff on a Friday evening so you're more than welcome to join us awesome all right it was uh, really enjoyable, guys. It's, uh, thank you for, for, for organizing it. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for joining us. This was awesome. Very good.